One church with many locations. We are one body with many members. One people, one people with many generations. We have one mission with many fields. One spirit but many gifts. One direction and many parts. One culture. Kingdom culture. Many, many nations. nations. We are one heart with many hands. One faith with many expressions. One team, many players. And there is one God. One God. One God. One God. One God. And there is just one God. There is one God. There is one God. Welcome to Turning Point Church Online. I hope you're having a great day and thank you for joining us this morning. This morning we have our senior minister, Pastor Phil, who will be sharing the word with us. So why don't you join? Why don't you get comfortable, sit down, get a coffee, get whatever you need and relax and join us for our service. Just so you know, we're across multiple campuses, Turning Point. So if you want to know more about our campuses, go to our website. God bless you. Have a great day.
Well, it's great to be with you again, Turning Point, and together we're going to be able to share the Word of God. See, we're coming to an end of the financial year. Each year, around June, you get all those sales, the end of the year, end of financial year sales. Rush in, buy this, buy that, because if you buy this, it'll make a difference in your life. Well, I think we're a bit smarter than that. But the truth of it is, too often what happens is we get tested and tempted to do things that others want and we end up becoming what others expect. I still remember one day someone was making a joke about, you know, oh, who would buy these expensive shoes or these expensive jeans? And then they suddenly realized all the people I'd speaking to were wearing them. Yet only a few minutes earlier, they were saying, we are individuals. We make our own decisions. Or too often what we do is we become what others tell us to. But I would hope that we'd look past that. So we're coming to an end of a year, and the end of a year financially is not what do we get financially, but the question is what do we get to leave? So the big thing I've discovered is the measure of maturity can be measured between a child and an adult very simply. A child wants, an adult gives. Today, I'm asking this question. As we come to an end of a financial year, what are you giving? What is the legacy that you're going to leave behind? See, some years ago, it's nearly 30 years ago, the Simpsons flashed onto our screens and they became what was deemed a normal family. Well, I'm glad that wasn't a normal family. With a selfish father only looking after himself, a son who just is only interested in getting away or stealing what he can, a mother who just says, well, that's what life is. Another daughter that's just focused on herself. See, too much we see self, self, self. But the truth is that we have an opportunity to leave a legacy that's going to outlast us. So today I want to ask some questions. If you happen to live into a good, ripe old age of about 90, well, in the Bible we've got some guys that live to 120, even some older but I reckon 90 is a good age. So by the age of a person hitting 90, you would not have only had your children and your grandchildren, but you'll be looking at your great grandchildren. And so at the age of 90, would you be considering, I need to leave a legacy, an inheritance? What would that look like? Well, most people would immediately jump to the thought of, oh, it's money. Well, the bad news is you'll never get to see them enjoy the money if you give it to them after you've gone. Legacy of money is not really that great because it comes and it goes. See, some will then say, well, we want to leave them a legacy of something special, like, you know, a photo. Have you got any photos at home of your grandparents that are stuck in a cupboard somewhere? In fact, we've got this box that came from England with our family many generations ago. And it's been handed down. And I remember as a child that I used to play with it. It's one of those boxes that got all these hidden compartments. And I used to get into it and think, oh, this is incredible. Well, after my parents passed, guess what? I inherited it. And I was so excited. Well, now my children have come and they've moved on. And guess what? They didn't get much excitement out of that box. Now my grandchildren are there. They see it, but they've never actually asked to pray for it. So they don't really play with this thing because it doesn't mean anything to them. Legacy's got to be much more than a gift or a photo. Well, you could say, I'm going to leave them a house. Well, who wouldn't like a house? Add 90 years and then ask the question, is a house a blessing or a hindrance? 90 years, I can tell you there's going to be a fair bit of maintenance needed. Well, what about this one? I'm going to leave them an inheritance of faith in Jesus. The truth is, if you leave that, I can be sure of one thing. It will never wear out. It will never be forgotten. It won't be left in the cupboard. And it's going to last a lot longer than any money. So today, I want to bring some challenges to you about how you see yourself in your church, how you see yourself actually living out your life and becoming a legacy for others to follow. See, if I went back in years past, everywhere we saw a town get built of about 100 people, there would be a church. It only needs about 100 people to qualify to get a church built. And you go through some of the countrysides. In fact, 
you see three houses and a church. You know, they found places to build them because they're everywhere. Today, it's around about every 5,000 people we get a church built. In fact, we have communities now that have been designed to operate as about twenty to 30,000 people and not one church has been planned in it. Well, the truth is this. I want to tell you that we are to leave a legacy and we need to make a stand about what it is. Let me just go through some verses of scripture, them. some of my favorites in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 11, it says this. It is he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. For what reason? To prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So today, if we're going to leave a legacy, we've got to build up a strong church. The church that's going to look after us, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren. The legacy is going to last. But how do we do that? First, we've got to have people that are, what's it say, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. They're all different giftings serving God in their unique way. And we need to see that being raised up within our church. Now we ask, why do we need this? Because in verse 13 says, until we all reach the unity of faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, obtaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Remember what I said about maturity before? Maturity we can be measured when somebody is a giver, not a taker. Today there are many people who are just interested in what they can get. But let me challenge you. Jesus came not as a taker, but as a giver. God, even though he has the power to do anything, came as a giver to us. He did not come to cause us pain. He came to give us life and life abundantly. Verse 14 goes on to say, then we will no longer be infants. Remember the contrast? A mature, wise person is one who can give, but an infant is tossed back and forth by every wind by every cunning, cunning area, by everything that will just captivate you to take you away because all they're interested in is grabbing hold of it and they give in to the cunningness of men and deceitful teaching. In fact, today, there are lots of cults around. There are a lot of weird religions around. Some of them are believing that spaceships are going to come and rescue us. Others are believing if they commit suicide, they're going to meet God. There's some really strange things out there. Because all of them are focused on what they can get, not what they can give. Verse 15, it goes on and simply puts it this way. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up in him. Let me just say that again. Grow up in him. Who is the head? That is Christ. We are to grow up into Christ. For in him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting limit grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work see today that is what we're called to do to actually rally together to become a church that's going to make a difference and that's going to leave a legacy for others to be part of so my challenge is today how do you fit into this church well i want to go through just a few simple points what does a healthy church look like well, a healthy church looks like it's got a diversity of people. That's from all different nationalities, different ages, you know, different genders involved in doing things. A church that is active is a church that's going to be having everybody involved. From the young, I love seeing the young ones up on the platform singing. And then there's some other older ones who get those good old hymns out. And everyone has a place. We need to see that. Because, see, as I said before, in Ephesians 4.11, it says that God gave gifts. He identified ascension gifts here. But the reality is we all have gifts. Let me read it again. And he gave one, sorry, and he is the one who gave these gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And it's their responsibility to equip God's people to do his work. See, that's our job. If we want to have a healthy church, you know what it means? Putting in. If you turn up to church and say, I want, then you've just told me that you're a child, an infant. But if you come to give, 
then you've become mature and you're learning. See, Peter puts it this way. And now God is building you as living stones into a spiritual temple who's more that you are a colleague. So you are God's holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. It says we are lively stones being built. Now we are the spiritual temple. When we gather together, we emulate the goodness of God. See, a healthy church has all different people involved. Number two, healthy churches focus on Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people out there saying, we've got to focus on this or this, you know. We've got to defend the poor. We've got to defend the uh, those who are being afflicted. We've got to give food. We've got, you know, all of those things are good. In fact, Jesus did them all. He taught us to do them all. But the truth of it is, is, we do those things because of Jesus. We don't do those things to lead us to Jesus. Jesus leads us to do the good things. The church is not about us. Let's all say this together. The church is not about you or me. One more time. The church is not about you or me. It's about Jesus. And that's the only thing we should be focusing on. As we go on, we read in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. It is Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. It's in Christ that gives us hope. There's a lot of people still struggling with hope. Now in Victoria, our fourth lockdown. Well, people are saying, well, what are we going to do? Well, without Jesus, I could ask, what are we going to do? But with Jesus, we can do great things together. Number three. Healthy churches are one in Christ. That means we all work together. See, we are the church of God. We have lots of different people, lots of different attitudes and hearts and desires and abilities, but together we do stand as one. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 says this, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature fully grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Do you know how you grow up and become the full stature of Christ? Well, you come into unity. I bet there are some people who have upset you. I bet there's probably even some you can think of now that have upset you. Maybe they're even in your church. Or even worse, they could even be in your family. But you know what? The mature person is able to bring peace. The child fights for his own until we all come into unity of the faith and the knowledge of God that loves us all as one, we become mature, grown up in the Lord. John 17, verse 20, which is our theme for this year. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through this message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are, in me and I am you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you know the greatest way to share Jesus? You show the love of Jesus. And where else to start it? At your home? At your church? At your workplace? There we can then show it out to others and build something that is strong to bring a change to the world that we live in. Number four. Healthy churches are doctrinally sound. Do you know there's some weird things getting around today? People will say that, oh, the devil's in the vaccine. It's going to put the mark of the beast. Well, that little chip that they believe is going to get injected is pretty small. See, people came up with some weird ideas. And if you go through history, there are thousands of these weird ideas. And all they do is they make Christians look stupid. Let me tell you, the only thing that's sound is the word of God. And we've got to stay on that. See, verse 14 of Ephesians 4 says it like this. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by every wave, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Do you know, Facebook today, I'd say every few minutes, there's a new conspiracy theory. I've got to say, I'm a terror. I love them because... 
they are like humour to me. I just think they're so incredibly funny that people have got time to sit down and make up things that they know is so stupid that no one in their right mind could believe, but people do believe it. Even worse, sometimes Christians believe it. Even Christians respond to it. Sometimes even Christians give money. I don't know whether you realise, but if you follow things on YouTube and Facebook and they get lots of hits, that means that the person who presented it actually gets lots of money. So followers of that actually supporting these weird ideas. Let me tell you, this is not God's intent. In fact, Timothy puts it this way, 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when man will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We have that today. You know, there are so many people declaring right is wrong and wrong is right. You know, the things that we would grow up and say, this is a normal process. Now they say, no, that's not normal. That's been abusive. And we get these weird things. We've got to come back to the truth. And we've just got to put it so simply as this, that we got to say what we stand for. Let me just read the statement. It is not enough to say we believe the right stuff. We have to live it. Let me say that again. It's not enough to say that we believe the right stuff. We have to live it. Says so Christians today, people are reading us. Families today are reading us. They want to know one thing. Is this real? You know how you can measure reality? If you are consistent. If one day you say, I'm going to church, the next day you say you don't, you've just told everyone church isn't important. That's true. If you go to church, uh, sorry, you go to work one day and don't go to work the next day, then the boss is going to say, you don't value this job and you're going to lose it. So we understand that from a natural, but we don't understand it from a spiritual. We're building a legacy that will last, that will make a difference. James 1 and verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Today, my challenge, do what it says. The word of God says tithe. Guess what? Tithe. The word of God says bring offerings into the house of God. Bring offerings in the house of God. If the word of God says, make sure your mouth doesn't have unclean words coming out of it. Cleanse your mouth and make sure you've got a correct standard to live by. Because see, we need not be just hearers and say, oh, that reads really good. We need to be livers of what it is. Number five, healthy churches are loving. Don't you just love a loving family? Well, so love a loving church. God wants us to grow up and know the whole truth and to tell it in love like Christ in everything. Do you know, think about this in a home. You've got your three-year-old child and he's just starting to run around a bit and you think, oh, well, I'll just let him do what he likes. And so he opens up the knife drawer and he starts playing with knives. Would you think of the smart parent would just sit back and say, oh, we'll let him go. Or would a smart parent say, I'm going to tell you that knife even though you might want to play with it, can actually hurt you. And you then tell them the correct way to use it or to handle it. See, in Christ, we've got the same. There are many people trying to do things that are so wrong. So we need to correct them in love. Not to tell them that you did a wrong thing picking up that knife or you did a wrong thing doing that, but speak to them and help them understand. There's a place for everything and everything in its place. That's what sin is, when it's taken out of its place. When we take worship out of God and give it to the devil, it's in the wrong place. When we take sex out of marriage and put it somewhere else, it's the wrong place. All these things God has created for our benefit. So we've got to grow up, speak the truth and live it. We see here in 1 Peter and chapter 4 and verse 8, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I'm sure you've all had children or relatives that have really done some bad, but you've loved them. You've looked past them because you are in relationship. I want you to see that same thing in relationship with the church. I want you to see how God's relationship for us overlooks our sin. The Bible says, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
I want you to see that picture. Number six, healthy churches reflect Jesus to the world. I remember when I was training as an apprentice and I used to have to go down and do block release because I lived in the country, went down there and lived two weeks in some of the roughest areas of the city because that just happened to be where my school was that I was training in. And I remember I met all these strange guys that just come from all over the state to do the same sort of training. And as I was there, you'll never guess, I got to know them. They got to know me. But my second trip down, I realised they knew everything about me. Well, not quite. They knew the town, the house, the job I had. I even knew my girlfriend, Norma, at that time. But you know what they didn't know? They did not know that I loved Jesus. And it challenged me on that next time down. If we are healthy people, we let people know about who we are. We don't have any problems. You know, if I wouldn't tell anyone about Norma, everyone would think there's something wrong with me because I'm embarrassed about her. Well, I definitely wasn't. I told them. But it made me think, was I embarrassed about Jesus? Because I hadn't referred Jesus to them, introduced Jesus to them. And so my next trip, you'll never guess what I did. I shared Jesus. And it was actually great fun watching their responses. Some says, well, I can run with that. I can understand that. But we've got to be strong and declare Jesus to the world, reflect Jesus. Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking the truth of love, we will grow up in these things and it's to up to sorry grow up in all things into him who is the head that is christ when we become mature we will become like christ we'll represent christ we'll talk about him in everything we do let me ask you that challenge today in your conversations what do people know about you your faith your family your career your ministry Check those things and just see. Number seven, healthy churches involve everyone. So guess what? Everyone who's listening, you need to be actively involved. What does that mean? Well, can I suggest this? Get there early and sweep the path. Get involved. See, if you're going to own a home, you need to learn how to mow the lawn. If you're going to be a part of the church, you need to have to respect one another. And my encouragement, learn how to be involved. Ephesians 4 and verse 16 says it like this. From him, of course, Jesus, the whole body, that's the church, is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, growing and building itself up in love as each part does its work. That can't be any more plain, can it? Let me read it backwards. As you do your job, you grow up. Well, if you don't do your job, you're not going to grow up. How do we know that you're doing your job? Because every ligament, that's every part that's linked together, works. And you know, I saw a, a show like during lockdown, every now and then Norma and I get out a, a show and we're watching this medical one. And this one particular scene, there was this person who was a great violinist and they came in with a little bit of problem with their fingers. Well, they then went and tested and discovered that it was some growth that not only in the finger, but moved from the arm. And something terrible, they had to amputate the arm. And in the show, of course, here they are. He's got this lady laying on his table, and there's the arm over on his other table. And it really hit me. Do you know what? That arm is a perfectly good-looking arm. But while it's not connected to the body, it's perfectly useless. Today, you might have every gift. But if you're not using it in the kingdom of God, then it's useless. Every supporting ligament, every part joined together, everybody doing it. Because, see, the church is not the person up the front. The church is the body of Christ, everyone working together. Start with the sweeping of the path, handing out things, cleaning up things. Then find someone to pray for. Bring some new people along. Speak life. Share a Bible verse with them. Find ways to be what you are. You might have musical talent. Use it for the Lord. If you don't have musical talent, train some. If you can't sing, learn to. If you can't share the gospel, read the Bible. There's things that we can do to become active. And we know very well in a human sense, if you're not being feeling well, you will normally lay in bed. Then you get out of bed after you feel a bit better. All of a sudden, your muscles are not working. And you've got to go through some routine, some exercise, some stretches to gain your strength. 
Well, let me tell you, you'll never be a strong Christian without exercise, stretching, developing yourself. Get into it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ. Who? You. If you love Jesus, you're the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Not the person up the front. Not some particular person who's got a great revelation or prophecy. Every one of us in it. Because see, we're to see that within the body, there are no unimportant roles. Your role is essential. And if you don't do it, the body is weak. Everyone is important. Everyone is needed. And without you, we are incomplete. I don't care. You know, you put a baby in a house. What value are they? They don't clean the floor. They don't make any money. They don't help cook the dinner. But if a baby was in a house and then passed away, there would be incredible sadness. Do you know what? Today there's sadness because we are not rising up to it. I challenge you today to stop and consider where you are in involving yourself in building a legacy. A legacy means that you are going to get involved. Every person, people are different people from all over the place are going to get involved. You're going to focus on Jesus. We are united in Christ as one. We are doctrinally sound because we live on the word of God. We are loving. We reflect Jesus to the world and everyone is involved. Today, we can make a difference to change the world. So my challenge is this. Consider your place. Consider your legacy. What will you invest into the kingdom of God that will last for generations to come? Lord, bless you as you continue to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Well, that was a great word and great worship. Now, like I said before, if you want to know more about Turning Point, visit our website. We have locations right across the southeast of Victoria. So visit our website, get to know us more. If you need some more information, contact our office or let us know via our webpage. Again, thank you for joining us. Hope you have a great day. God bless you all.